There's lots of warnings in Scripture to drive what we do at Stand Firm. One, and you've heard it several times, if you're following along in these teachings and through our conferences, then you've heard me say, Matthew 24, 10, that a time is coming when many will turn away. The second one, found in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11, where we read that God will send them a powerful delusion, or some versions will say deception, so that they will believe the lie. Now, we just read this verse in one context there. It just seems as if God's just giving this blanket, vague uh, deception. But the context is related to the coming of the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, and the deception that will come from him and the false prophet doing miracles on his behalf. And God allows those who seek that and pursue that to be given over to that deception. So when we say Matthew 24, 10, many will turn away in the context of that being at the hands, especially of persecution and difficulty. In the past, they would call that the great apostasy, the great turning away. So you have the great turning away, but then we also have the great deception. Now, deception's all around us. The number one warning I think you see in the New Testament is, is beware of false teaching. But there's coming an ultimate deception. The deception, it's it's going to pull the rug out of under the faith of many. And that's why we're talking about this here at Stand Firm. So welcome to our session one of our conference, A Liar is Coming. These were two-part conferences I've been doing around the country for the last several years that now are doing online because of uh, COVID and the related shutdown. Now, the liar hopefully has nothing to do with what I'm trying to say, but it's talking about one who's coming and Scripture warns about. So this is session one, a liar is coming, and we're going to dive into that liar, the Antichrist, and the deception he brings and the possible and very likely role that Islam plays in the deception that he brings. As we do in every time, We have these teachings on Thursday nights, these conferences. We dive into the beautiful timeline that you've seen over and over again. Now, for many of you who track with Bible prophecy, you look at this and say, oh, he's left out a lot of things. Good. That's what I want. Uh, We've tried to just boil it down to the things that if you know these things, then you know the flow of where things are headed and what's coming. And so we begin here looking at this. So we... If you look at the timeline, we're in this present age. This present age will continue until Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom, which is the next age. We call the millennial kingdom, this thousand-year period in which Jesus will rule on earth. Those who are saved will rule with him in perfect glorified bodies like he had after the resurrection. And it says we will reign with him for those thousand years. But before that age begins... In the final seven years of this age, we're told a lot is going to happen. And we get the idea of the final seven years from Daniel 9. Daniel is 70th week in the vision he has there, which begins, the the time clock begins with the Antichrist in power and enough power to make an agreement or strengthen an agreement with Israel. In that agreement, three and a half years in, he breaks that agreement and turns against Israel and we enter into the great tribulation. So if you're able to see the timeline, of course, the upside down cross, the Antichrist, the peace sign that uh, possibly peace agreement, he strengthens the skull and crossbone being when he turns against Israel and we enter into the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, culminating in the battle of Armageddon as the armies of the world gather against Israel and Jesus steps in, saves them. And he's now on earth establishing his kingdom And Satan is locked up. That's the lock. For a thousand years, Satan is locked up. He's let loose after those thousand years, creates a rebellion just like at the end of this age. And of course, Jesus wins. That's the trophy. And then the earth made new and this amazing city, the new Jerusalem comes down that those who have trusted him as their savior and followed him will enjoy forever. Somewhere in these final seven years, Believers who are dead in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected to meet their souls as Jesus comes and appears. 
And those who are alive in Christ will be raptured up and brought back with him for his kingdom. So we've talked about in previous sessions the present age that we're in. We've talked about in this age, even though challenges are coming, we've got challenges right now. As Esther, as it says in Esther, we're in such a time as this. And that's what Stand Firm is here for, to help you navigate through these times. There's a lot of opinions out there. There's a lot of advice, many of it biblical. But if we don't have the end in mind when we come and we look at the whole picture, then we're not getting the full advice. We've got to be able to understand the times that we're in to navigate through them. That's why in our second set, our second conference, we looked at you called You Are Here. We looked at where are we in this present age? And we talked about we're way down the track and you ain't crazy if you think and say that we could be near the end of this age. So what are we looking to happen? What's looking to happen next? Well, two places that we're looking that scripture is very clear about. One is the return of the Jewish people to Israel, which has happened. And at least we know there will be a reestablishment of the daily sacrifice, possibly a rebuilding of the temple to some degree. So that's what we're looking for in that front. On the other front, in which scripture probably even talk, talks even maybe gives us more details about, is the rise of the Antichrist and his empire, his these his nation, his kingdom. And that's where we're diving in today as we look at a lot is coming. And because I don't want you to just take my word for it, I want you to be a Berean and dig into the text yourself. You can go to stanfordministries.com slash liar message. Really terrible title, right? Liar message. And you can find notes to follow along and fill in the blanks. You can also find those in on your Facebook page. They're in the uh, description of the video. You can also find them over on YouTube in the, in the notes. But if you want to follow along, you can download that. And then if you want the answers, you can find the answers there at A Liar's Coming, along with other resources and recommended resources. So the question that we're going to ask in these two sessions about A Liar's Coming, we're going to talk about the rise of the Antichrist, leading up to him being in a position to make and strengthen that agreement with the nation of Israel, with the Jewish people. The Bible talks a lot about his rise, a lot about his origin, and that's what we'll get at session. First session, we're going to look at the deception that will come to earth at the hands of the Antichrist and the likely role that Islam will play in it. Before I talk much about the Antichrist, I want to make sure that we remember who the hero story of the events of the end of the age is. We don't want to give the Antichrist too much credit. We don't want to give the Antichrist too much power because there's a hero of this story. This hero is Jesus. In his return, his saving of his people, and the establishment of his kingdom. If you ever see the graphic on the screen, that's from our children's book, Jesus and His White Horse. Whatever age you are, if you want to talk about the return of Christ, get that book. It was a challenge that we've been wanting to tackle for quite a while. How can you write a children's book uh, on the return of Christ? And so in trying to meet that challenge, what the Lord ended up doing through me and Tyson Raines, the illustrator, is we got finished that, we look back and we're like, wow, we were able to tell the story with excitement and anticipation, not fear as we typically look at the end times. I encourage you, if you've got kids, tell them the whole story, including that. But the hero of the story is Jesus. Revelation 19 talks about his return. Verse 11, it says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider was called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and make war, makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings 
Lord of Lords. And he comes up against the Antichrist, the false prophet, and defeats them. The, the description, Jesus appearing on the white horse with the army of heaven behind him, which I believe you would include which is those who've been resurrected and raptured all the believers before this moment coming behind him. I think you also probably likely includes uh, angels as well. Eyes blazing like fire, a name written on him, written on his forehead that no one but himself knows and robe dipped in blood, which we will be doing in a later session called the return and the rapture, where we'll talk in more detail about some of these detail these aspects. Before we dive into the deception that's coming, and into the Antichrist, let's remember the hero of the story. If you're following along in the blanks there, that we've talked about the timeline, but I also want to take you back to the last teaching we did, you are here, session two, as we talked about the, the prolific uh, prophecy of Israel ultimately being scattered and then being brought back to their homeland, the Jewish people. And in that, we began with setting the tone and saying, okay, what is everything building up to? What If we could take a snapshot of the end of this age, what is it? That snapshot is Israel being completely surrounded by the Antichrist and the armies of the world. Again, it's maybe a little overly simplified, but building up to this siege, being surrounded, the Antichrist planning to wipe Israel out. I mean, this is something that has been attempted uh, throughout history. And Jesus arrives and saves his people. Jesus is the hero of this story. But a liar is coming before that. And as we looked at 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. God will send them this powerful delusion. But I, I want to back up and, and read the context there. So we're not just seeing this one verse out of context. Because two things are happening. One, there's deception brought on by the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then it's God allowing that to happen, as with anything. So we, we pick up in verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians, 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, when we get into the epistles, we often have Paul writing to answer questions, but we don't have a question. And so some blank, what was he, why is he talking about this? Listen to what the question that he's answering here. He says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord had already come. So what is he dealing with? Somehow he has heard that the believers in Thessalonica have been told or received a letter supposedly from Paul in which told them the Lord has already come back. Remember it said his return, which we understand what his return is, is when him phys physically touching down and being here on earth. But the gathering, that's what we simply, we call the rapture, but it's him coming in the, in the sky, appearing in the sky, and those dead in him being resurrected, those alive in him being raptured up to him. And so Paul is saying, hey, hey guys, if you hear this, just know that didn't come from us. Can you imagine this? I mean, we're only talking uh, no less than, you know, 30 years, maybe from the time Jesus ascended to earth. I mean, this is very early on and somebody's already spreading the word. Somebody's already teaching prophecy wrong. Go figure, right? And Paul tells them. So think about it. Paul is writing. He has a chance to tell these new believers what to look for, to know the timing of the return of the Lord. And what, this is what he says. He says, do not let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come. What day? Well, the gathering and the return will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness. Now, the man of lawlessness is referring to the Antichrist. This man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is uh, called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God taken straight out of Daniel 9, 
talking about the abomination of desolation where the Antichrist sets himself up or an image of himself to be worshipped uh, there in relationship to the temple. This is don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. We had a prophecy conference when we were there. You guys should have took notes, right? Too bad Paul wasn't sending them notes with blanks in it so that they could follow, you know? And he wasn't sending them to uh, the apostlepaul.com slash liar message and so they could go and look at the notes and look it up for themselves. Anyway, for the secret power, says verse six, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness already at work, but the one who now holds it back, will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed with whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance. And this is what I really want you to pay attention to. The coming of the lawless one or the coming of the Antichrist will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, what reason? Well, this deception is coming by the hand of the Antichrist, these miracles done through the power of of Satan. But those who did not hear the truth when it was preached. Those who did not turn to Christ, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe that lie. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So a lot being said here. To me, this is the passage. I was almost a nail in the coffin and understand the timing of the rapture, but we're not going to go there. We'll go there in a few teachings down the road. But it's talking about the man of lawlessness, lawlessness coming, the Antichrist appearing. And how is he going to work? He's going to do counterfeit miracles and wonders. He's going to bring deception. There's going to be a great deception, and it's completely tied to what the Antichrist does. And this is not a one off statement. This is something that is a theme moving throughout teachings about the coming of the Antichrist. To show that, let's walk through a few of them. Matthew 24, verses 4 through 5. So Matthew 24, the ultimate prophecy conference that's ever existed, as Jesus is there at the Mount of Olives, the place that uh, where we read in Zechariah that the Messiah will step when he comes back, when he returns. And he's there, and the disciples ask us, Ask him, what's the sign of your return? Jesus sits down and walks them through it. Beautiful what we have. Listen to what's going to happen. Just skipping a a few, focusing in on this aspect of deception. Verses 4 and 5, how Jesus kicks it off. First point. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. So Jesus says there's going to be many who come claiming to be the Messiah. We need to be aware of that. A little generalized, but something we need to watch for. Same chapter, same message from Jesus, but he gets more detailed about that deception. Verse 21. He says, for then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginnings of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Now, context of this, the, this is referring at the heels of the abomination of desolation, which is when, the, again, the Antichrist sets himself up to be worshipped, or an image of himself, and he turns against Israel, that midway point, remember, uh, uh, in those final seven years. So at the heels of this, Verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if that was possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So Jesus says there's going to be false Christ. But then he says there, there's going to come one. There's going to come one uh, who is going to come. And he says, is out. 
Well, we're going to get to that. But if one comes and begins to perform miracles and false and wonders that are even going to deceive, could just the amount of deception he's talking about is just insane. And we read on. Verse 26, so if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner room, do not believe it. For a, as lightning that comes from the east and visible even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It goes on to more details. But so he says there's false Christ. Then he says there's going to be false Christ, a false Messiah, false prophet in the desert, which is a very interesting clue. And he says, performing miracles. He says, when you hear that, and they're saying, this is the Messiah, look at what he's doing. Don't go out there. Because even though that may seem like it's me, and it may be close to me, he says, it's not going to be because when I come, it is going to be as visible from the east as the west. It said, Scripture says, every eye will see Christ when he appears in the sky. That's the thing we're waiting for. It ain't Jesus if it ain't peering in the sky and everybody's seeing him. And it's at that time he peers in the sky that we see this gathering if we go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. But this deception, he says it's such a deception that would deceive the elect if that was possible. And of course, that opens a whole other can of worms, right? But Jesus is saying, and he says in there, see, I told you this ahead of time. Says it's important that you know because this is going to be some serious deception. So we see this in Matthew 24. We see I already mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2. Jump to the book of Revelation. Revelation 6, uh, verse 1. Revelation 6, verse 1. So Revelation 6 is where we see the seals being opened. Now, the seals being opened, this is seen in heaven that John is being able to see in the vision. But it's things happening on earth. And this is where we get the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, again, the, the idea not being necessarily, not being that, okay, these different color horses are going to run across the earth. No, I mean, it's symbolism showing something that's coming. Verse 1, it says, I watched as the lamb... Jesus opened the first of the seven seals, and then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice of thunder, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a white horse, and its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror built on conquest. So the first one, this rider on the this white horse coming to bring, seemingly bringing peace and bringing conquest. So this is referring to the events that are going to unfold at the end of the age. Uh, this, I believe, is completely talking about the Antichrist who will come offering peace. It's going to bring, seemingly bring peace, but it's going to be also with conquest. And listen to what's going to follow him. This isn't necessarily talking about different people coming as we read these other horses and other riders. It's talking about the events that's going to bring. So you have one who comes appearing to be one on white horse, bringing peace to the earth, yet he will be bent on conquest. It says, verse 3, when the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another rider came out, a fiery red one. This rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. And to him was given a large sword. So we've Ultimately, all of this talking about what happens at the hands of the Antichrist, but the Antichrist coming initially, seemingly bringing peace, seemingly being a savior, seemingly being a Messiah, right? We already read, watch out for these false messiahs, seemingly bringing peace, but with that ultimately comes war. Verse five, when the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and there before me was a black horse and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a day's wages, three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. So Antichrist, what he's going to do is going to seemingly bring peace. It's going to be involve conquest. It's going to lead bring war. And that's ultimately going to, bring in famine, uh, economic troubles, uh, whatever comes at the, being described here from this. 
And we already know, right? The one, you know, the, the main things that we hear talked about when we talk about prophecy is the the rapture and the mark of the beast. And if you think about the mark of the beast, this mark that you're not that unless you have it, you can't buy or, or sell. And so we see the economy, and we'll get to that verse in a, in a bit. But verse seven. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I, I looked and it's, I looked and there were before me was a pale horse and its rider was named death and Hades was followed close behind him. And they were given the power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague by the wild beast of the earth. And so again, following that is death. So why take the time to walk through all of this? Well, so Matthew 24, 4 through 5. So 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11, talks about great deception. Matthew 24, 4 through 5, talks about false Christ or false messiahs. Matthew 24, 21 through 27, talks about the miracles and wonders that will be done. And here it talks about the Antichrist initially bringing peace which is also what Daniel 9 talked about, that he would usher in this agreement, strengthen this agreement that would bring peace, but eventually he would break that. One other passage, Revelation 13, verse 11. Revelation 13, verse 11. And I know it's, if you're like me, let's say, hey, let's park and let's talk about what you just read. But I, I want you to see, it's not just one place where we hear about the deception that's going to come. Rather, it's what Scripture says collectively. It's going to happen at the hands of the Antichrist. So much of what we hear, see, and done, is done about the Antichrist just kind of runs with the Antichrist theme and just goes its own direction. Well, scripture talks about very clearly what's going to happen. So Revelation 13 is where we get the details. So in chapter 13, it talks about two beasts one from the sea and one from the earth. The one from the sea uh, that it talks about first is in reference to the Antichrist. It talks about him leading and coming to lead. I encourage you to go and read through that as well. But then in verse 11, it picks up and talks about this other beast that we that is referred to as the false prophet coming alongside the Antichrist. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth with two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. So he claimed to be a lamb, but in reality, he was a dragon. And just throughout scripture, what who lamb? It's Jesus, right? Who's the dragon? That's Satan. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, the Antichrist whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven in earth and full view of men. Miraculous signs and wonders. Well, we heard Jesus say coming. What Paul writes to those in Thessalonica. John here picking up through this revelation, this same thing, connecting the same thing at the hands of... And, so, but John's revealing a bit more. It's not just at the hands of the Antichrist, but it's this false prophet that comes appearing and, and pretending to be a lamb. He's really a dragon. Him come and performing these things so that worship is brought back to the Antichrist. Verse 14 Because of these signs, he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, the Antichrist. He deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image to honor the beast who was wounded and this by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could, could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free to slay, to receive a mark on his right hand, his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. And that's where we get into that 666. So the detail here is remarkable. So when we read about the first beast, the Antichrist, it talks about him having this wound, this deadly wound, and it being heal healing and him coming back. Now, I don't dive into that because I think 
there's possible two things going on, and I, I don't have a certainty on either one of them. So I, I'll say that I don't know Kark. But for the most of the time, when I hear people discussing, discussing ideas of prophecy, they get hung up on that part about this wound being healed and what that means and how that will happen. And they get hung up on the mark of the beast. When the meat that we really need to see here is this false prophet's going to do these signs and wonders because that's what Jesus repeated. It's what Paul repeated. He repeats this other stuff. But the focus here should be there's one coming who's going to have authority to do signs and wonders like Jesus. He is going to claim to be the lamb. He's going to claim to be like Jesus. And he's going to perform these things, but he's going to point all the glory and point people back to the Antichrist and bring worship to him. Now, this, this idea of the wound being healed, you know, many have attached that to that there, the Antichrist will physically have a real head wound that will be miraculously healed and that lead to other things. And, and I think scripturally that's on the table. Uh, but there's also, and you would see this throughout other teachings, this idea of it not referring to just the Antichrist, but it referring to his kingdom that received a wound. That Because we see in Revelation 17, 9 through 11, it says that there, this kingdom was, and then it will go away, and it will come back. And so it attaches with, so the most biblical support would be that it's not just talking about the Antichrist, but it's talking about his whole kingdom. And it's nothing strange in scripture or historical literature from that time and era and in the Middle East to refer to bouncing back between the king and his kingdom. We see that all throughout the book of Daniel with King Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know. I think it especially talks about his kingdom. I, I think there's a lot of clarity there, but I think it's still to say on the table, it could be the wound, but whatever that is, let's put that in the back of our mind. It's a detail that matters, but let's zone in on what we know is clear here that this false prophet is going to come and do miraculous signs. So just play this out here. First, again, following on with the blanks, this last statement here. Uh, since the seemingly general warning of deception in Matthew and 2 Thessalonians match the detailed description performed by the false prophet in Revelation 13, then the great deception referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2.11 is a very specific deception. The reason I say that is because it's, when we talk about the deception at the end of the age, it's easy just to talk about, you know, it's going to be deception. And then we start thinking what those lies can be and all those things. Now, I think there's multiple areas and layers to all of that. I don't want to discount that. But ultimately, the great deception, the ultimate deception falls into an antichrist and a false prophet that in a sense together is claiming to be a Messiah and they're going to initially seemingly bring peace, but ultimately war and, the, and death and economic troubles all follow behind that. But he gets people's attention by claiming to be as a lamb and performing these miraculous signs and wonders. So we've laid all this out. I know I walked through those passages really quick. But I want us to see it all together. I mean, it's almost overwhelming. You know, if we're, we're in a court case and I laid all this out and said, hey, this is saying that one of the big things about the Antichrist, he's a liar and a deceiver, and there's going to be a very specific deception. This is it. Look at the proof. I think we pretty much win the case, right? Or should. No, that's not always the case. But you being a smart and wise and discerning jury, I think you we would win the case. But let's put this together. Let's, let's, let's think. Let's think critically here. Let's picture this. So this Antichrist is coming. Daniel 9 talks very specifically that he's going to come and he's going to be in power to, make, to strengthen this agreement. Uh, and we we're going to talk more about his rise to power in the next uh, few sessions. But when he's there, and, pro and likely to get there, and at the midway, he's going to use deception, but the midway point, he's going to set himself up to be worshipped. And so you have this Antichrist who comes on the scene and is seen as a Messiah. And then you have this prophet who comes alongside of him, who appears to the world as a lamb, 
And he's able to do all these miraculous signs and wonders, and he points all of them back to Messiah. Can, can you imagine the deception and the struggle for a believer? I mean, I, so me, this, if this is going down right now, remember that verse in Matthew uh, 24, verse 27, it's talked about if you're here in the desert, if someone's out there doing miraculous signs and wonders, don't go. So let's just think. We've got our phones. We've got our TV. We've got whatever device we use. And we get a report. We see a posting. And some reason, Facebook doesn't block it, right? We see a post that there's some dude doing miracles. Well, no, back it up. That there is someone who is the Messiah who has come. And he has literally brought peace to the Middle East. He has fixed things between Israel and its neighbors, and he brings peace. And many are thinking he is the Messiah. Now, I think initially we'd be like, Psh, he's not the Messiah, but man, he's done some good things over there. And we're, then we start thinking, wow, a lot of people are on him being the Messiah. And then you have alongside of him coming these miraculous signs, and we're thinking, hearing it and seeing that, and we're like, wow. That's kind of like what Jesus did. And they're bringing these good news and they're seemingly bring peace. And, and then we start to think, okay, maybe this is Jesus. Maybe we understood, or maybe it's like, well, we just didn't know enough about prophecy anyway. So who knows what was going to really happen? So this is likely it, right? This is Jesus. Think about that. But I believe that there is even more of a specific understanding that we can have of what's going to go down. Now, there's a lot of talk in books and videos and go through YouTube and ask the question, who's the Antichrist? Someone gave me a book one time about Obama being the Antichrist. Uh, and, you know, they had found some evidence they believed in. But the predominantly, the views of who the Antichrist is or will be boil down to basically four aspects. We're supposed to hear us here in the States. The first one, being the Pope and being coming out of the Catholic Church. Now, this came from the Reformation, and you can see how it was a bit self-serving for the Reformers to say, hey, the uh, Antichrist, he's the Pope. He's, you know, As you have people breaking away from the Catholic Church, you can see why this was maybe a very appealing case. And then the focus has been on the middle on on Europe, on a revived Roman Empire out of Rome, uh, something possibly aligned to what it looked like was the European Union was headed to or even the UN or something like that. That's predominantly the view you would see. And then next many will talk about Russia maybe being the 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 empire, the nation of the Antichrist. Now, we'll get to this next week, but Scripture talks a lot about the Antichrist coming from the north, being the man of the north, invading from the north. And so Russia is due north. But there's other Scriptures that keep us going as far north as Russia, and we'll talk about that next week. And the next is the New World Order, the Illuminati, whatever you want to phrase it. But if we're going to go to where the most scriptural support is, be here to the next session. I'm going to lay all that scriptural support out. But I think the greatest reality is that it's going to be an Islamic Antichrist. As we will see, we'll walk through the passages. It is very clear the Antichrist is going to come out of the former Assyrian Empire. He's going to come out of, therefore, the Iraq, Syria, Turkey area. He's going to be a... Uh, Middle Eastern group of nations. I mean, they're, the biblical sports just overwhelming. But we want to stick on the deception aspect. So let's walk down this rabbit trail. It's not a rabbit trail, but anyway, you're with me. Let's walk down this idea that the Antichrist, because you, you, you hear all the time people talk about, you know, the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to bring this one world religion. Well, where do they get that from? They get it from what we just read. Did it necessarily say a one world religion? No, that the exactness was that the false prophet, through his signs and wonders, 
will bring the world to worship the Antichrist. Now, you can say, well, that's a one world religion. Yeah, but the difference here is when people talk about a one world religion, they have this idea that when the Antichrist comes on the, the scene, that a new religion can be created and conquer the world like that. And come on, is that any way that could remotely happen? Think of Christianity. I mean, 2,000 years, it has shocked the world how Christianity has spread. But we're 2,000 in, and we years in, we still got work to do. There's no way we can think of some new religion popping up and really taking root. Now, I know events can happen and be catalysts to really change aspects of the world, but still. So we'd have to believe that whatever is brought on through the Antichrist, it's got to have its roots in something that already exists, that's already dug in. I really think the case with Islam, it's very possible. Look at this image. If you're there in the notes, if you're there and you can make some comments, what is this image that you see? As a believer watching this over at Stand Firm or in Time Church or Armageddon News, what do you see? Well, it looks like Jesus coming back on the white horse, right? The Messiah. What about this one? The return of Jesus. Jesus coming back. Both of these are not Christian images. These come from Islamic posters and advertisements of the coming of their Messiah. They refer to him as the Mahdi. Just to give some context here. The Deja we will get to before we close today. This one. One man to come and unite them all on the white horse. It's not Jesus is talking about. It's talking about the Islamic Messiah, the Mahdi. Let's just talk about our Christian eschatology, which is eschatology, study of the end times. Let's think about the graph that I've burned in your mind if you've been following Stan Firm for quite a while. If it's just in a nutshell, if you talk about the characters or that it's going to be involved, what do we have? Well, we have the Antichrist, right? We have the Antichrist. Coming, this is an image of the four horsemen, five-ish horsemen. Coming, initially bring in peace. He will initially bring peace, usher in peace. And then it will, war will follow him. Well, if you go to Islamic eschatology, they have characters too, and they have a very pronounced and definite end-time scenario on their behalf. A lot of what we see from extremists, from jihadists, has roots in bringing and ushering in their eschatology, their end times. So the first character we would talk about is that Antichrist is going to appear. The first character they will talk about is that their Messiah will appear. Their Messiah, referred to as the Mahdi. That he would come, and he would come and bring peace to the Middle East. He would bring peace to Israel. He would unite the world under Islam. He would bring peace and prosperity to the world. And there's a lot of details given within Islam. It talks about him initially bringing a seven year of, of peace to, to Israel, bringing a seven year peace agreement. Day, straight out, what's in Daniel 9. It's even uh, some out there who talk about him bringing, finding the, the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know, that's not in deeply rooted details, but you can find that out there. But who they, who Christianity 
proclaims as their antichrist. If you go to Islamic eschatology, it matches their Messiah, their Mahdi. Okay, so remember what we talked about, the scenario. So in Christianity, we see it as this Antichrist is going to appear. He's going to initially bring peace to the world. He's going to unite uh, and bring peace into, into Israel, make an agreement with them. The world is going to see him as bringing peace. The world is going to unite towards him. Well, Islam sees this figure coming, who is their Messiah, their Mahdi, who will come, and he will bring peace to the world. He will unite all of Islam, and he will bring peace into Israel, among other things. It's the same. The eschatology of Islam mirrors Christianity. The Muslim Mahdi mirrors the Christian Antichrist. That makes sense. The one they see as the savior that's going to come and and rule all of the Islamic empire, caliphate, or the Islamic state. So right now, a lot of things are happening in Turkey, and we're going to talk more about this in coming sessions. Turkey is wanting to establish the Ottoman Empire, which was an Islamic state or Islamic caliphate that covered the Middle East and parts of Europe and Northern Africa. And it was led by their caliph. And if you talk in their eschatology, not only is it a desire to, for that to happen, but they want it to happen because the one who will come and rule that is the caliph that will rule that is the Mahdi, is the Messiah. So that's who they're looking for. Okay. Well, the next figure that we've talked about within. Christianity is the false prophet. So we have the Antichrist who will come and he will bring initially bring peace. And then alongside of him comes this false prophet who has the power and authority to do signs and wonders and miraculous things. And he will t- send people to worship the, the beast, the Antichrist. He's like the worship leader. He's But he's going to perform these miracles, going to suck people in. They're going to remember he's going to appear like a lamb. So that's who Christ, Christian, we're looking for the next character we look for after the Antichrist. Well, in Islam, when their Mahdi comes, when their Messiah comes, they have another figure who's going to come. And that figure is going to come along the side the Mahdi, is going to do miraculous signs and wonders. And he is going to support the Mahdi and draw others to the Mahdi and basically verify that this this Mahdi is the Messiah. Sounds just like our false prophet, right? Do you know the name of the sidekick of the Mahdi that they have? His name? Jesus. Within Islam, Jesus is a revered prophet. And in their eschatology, they have him coming back. And he comes back and does does the Jesus thing with the signs and wonders, right? But he clarifies... The one who is the Mahdi that is the Messiah is this other guy. Story of them coming to battle. And their Jesus being asked to pray. And he clarifies, it's not him, but it's this other guy. That's the Messiah. It's even confusing talking about, right? So our false prophet matches Islam's Muslim Jesus. Remember that verse? It says it will be like a lamb, but he's really a dragon. So so this man comes on the scene. the The Islamic world sees him as their messiah. 
He brings peace. He brings peace into Israel. He does what even Donald Trump couldn't quite finish on the deal. Oh, we're all saying this guy, yeah, this guy is something to this guy. He's the Messiah. And then lo and behold, Jesus comes back, does his miraculous signs, says, Yeah, this is legit. This is Jesus. But you know, all that stuff that you heard from Christians about me being the Messiah, you know, that wasn't true. My own people didn't even think that was true. Islam had it right. The Quran had it right. And though, yes, I am a prophet from the Lord, I am not the Messiah. This guy is. Therefore, you need to worship him. Yeah. And then you have us as Christians who, it's like, man, that's pretty interesting. This guy's bringing peace. That's like something Jesus would do. And they're thinking he's the Messiah. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. And this other guy comes up and they're saying he's Jesus. He's doing these signs. Like, man, that looks really legit. There's more. And then we have, after the Antichrist and the false prophet, we have the hero of the story, right? Jesus. Who comes against his people. Now, another detail I left out is that ultimately the Mahdi, the Messiah, will uh, rid the earth of the Jewish people of Israel. It says that the earth will say that there is, that will give up all, that there will be just a few left and they will, the earth will give them up for a horrific view. But we have in Christian eschatology that you have. The the Antichrist, the false prophet, and then you have the hero coming to save his people. You have a Jewish Messiah, Jesus, returning to save his people, to defeat and come against the Antichrist and the false prophet. Well, Islam has another figure who shows up. After the Antichrist has risen to power, brought peace, after he has destroyed, hammered the Jewish people after uh, this false prophet had done the one after the Jesus. Yeah, it's confusing to even talk about it. The Jesus comes and on, on the behalf, the Muslim Jesus comes and he performs these signs and wonders. And then this guy shows up, this Jewish guy within Islam shows up. They call him the Dejal. The Deja will come, and it talks about him having one eye, and there's just something miraculous about his eyes, and a, a name written on his forehead that in uh, Islam says, basically, deceiver. And he will come, and he will have the power to resurrect the dead, but it really won't be dead, people. It will be demons pretending to that. He will have the power to show others, people from their past who are now alive, and he will come to defend the Jewish people and fight against the Mahdi. So therefore, in Islam, this is the ultimate enemy, the Dajjal. And they go as far as to say he is the Antichrist. He is the deceiver. He will come. And everything that we say about Jesus returning, they say about the Dajjal. And just this past week, I dove into just what Muslims would say about the Dajjal. It is scary. It is absolutely scary. It's as if someone knew the story of Jesus' return and just ripped it off in every way they could and pegged it on the guy they're making their enemy. Remember the, so the deception is very specific. Remember? So what's going to happen? What's the scenario? Within Islam, they believe their Mahdi is going to rise to power. I believe actually we would see a jockeying and battling for which one's the right Messiah, then a Messiah would appear. The world, they would rally around him. He would bring peace. He would make peace with Israel. This false prophet comes along. Then he turns against Israel. The Mahdi turns against Israel. The false prophet brings people to worship and, and does these signs and wonders. And then eventually they believe that Dajjal's going to come and fight against the Mahdi, for the sake of Jewish people, and he will try to cl claim that he is powerful because he can raise the dead. 
But they say that's just lies. Don't believe it. One of the, the beliefs within Islam is that you will be safe. And if it's if you know a certain passage within the Quran, you will be safe from the Dajjal. And in just an oversimplified summary of what that passage is saying is, is that God has no son. Because this Dajjal is gonna, he's gonna be crazy. He's gonna claim to be the son of God. And he's gonna claim to have deity within himself. I know it's confusing, right? So what that means is there's a deception already laid out. Whether this is the one that gets everybody at the end times, but right now, yeah, I've seen figures as as 2050 that Islam would eclipse the, the amount, amount of Muslims in the world would eclipse the amount of Christians. And Islam has spread into Europe, spreading into America. And so if we just take that alone, not tying in it, influencing beyond that, there's going to go and come on the scene, bring in peace, the Mahdi. They rally behind him. But he's really the Antichrist. And then the false prophet, who they see as Jesus, can come on the scene. And so you have those who are watching, they're like, okay, this is Jesus. And then when Jesus returns, they will say, this is the day jewel. But it's really Jesus. Whew. That deception. Man, I know it, it really repeated over and over again. This scenario could have done it once and been sufficient, but this is huge. This is huge. Remember, God sends a powerful deception over them. A liar is coming. I don't believe it's anything new. I believe this trap that will be closed at the end of this age was set 1,300 years ago in a cave in Saudi Arabia. As Muhammad, I believe, visited, likely by Satan himself, brought these teachings out. That is not only teaching a false teaching and false truth, but is laying the framework that will belong to the Antichrist in his deception of the world. A liar is coming. And we need to stand firm. How do we do that? We prepare now. I don't think this is just something that we say the end of the age generation needs to understand when we got to pass it down. But I believe the deception within Islam is just going to continue to rise and be something we battle. Therefore, we need to be in the word. We need to be walking with the Lord so that we know the truth, so that our heart is sensitive to Holy Spirit working within us. But it's not about us just building a bunker for ourselves. We need to help others. We need to be spiritual preppers, spiritual warriors. A liar is coming. And it's very real, very tangible. The trap is set. Let's not step in it and help others not step in it. Thank you for being a part of A Liar's Coming, Session 1. Hope you'll stick around. I want to tell you about what we're, we have coming up and what's going on with Stand Firm. Again, thank you for being part of another Stand Firm conference, for being here for A Liar is Coming. Remember, you can go find the notes at standfirmministries.com slash liar message. And you can find not only the notes where you can fill in the blanks, but you can find the answers as well, along with other resources. Now, if you have not studied much of, of, among along the ideas or the lines of the Antichrist 
his final his kingdom being an Islamic kingdom, then you need to come next week, next Thursday, or if you're catching this later, go to the next video as we talk about the origin and the rise of the Antichrist. It's amazing what Scripture tells and gives us that's coming up. And we'll be talking about this more also on Fridays. Fridays at noon, Eastern, 11 Central with me. We have our show called Talking Stand Firm, where we give you a chance to ask questions. We take the comments that you've made tonight, and we answer those. We take questions there. Anything along the lines of what's been taught tonight and anything along the lines of Stand Firm. And we have often have special guests like we have coming up February the 19th, Sonia Zam. Oh, amazing. If you've not had the chance to, to tune in and hear her, and she's going to be talking about and answering questions about the Islamic eschatology and the Islamic uh, Antichrist. And then coming up February 26th, we have Daniel Seckham, who's going to be talking about politics in the last days. He's going to be here for the whole hour, and so it's going to be a chance for him to share an interview and then take questions. We also have some resources we would love to tell you about. Uh, we have our new designed store at StanFirmStore.com. You can go, and every uh, book that we suggest, all those that we've created are available there. Go and check it out. Uh, you just... You go, click books, takes you to all of our books, and then you can go to the uh, category section where it says filter by and filter by Antichrist and all the books that we recommend to talk more about the subject you can find. And so be sure to go check that out. Uh, please check out the materials that we've created from Stand Firm. You also can go to StanFirmMinistries.com and find articles and find other uh, resources to help you study along these lines. Of course, we've got our blog. If you'd like to be a financial partner with Stand Firm, uh, we would love to have you aboard. Uh, you can actually give and become a recurring giving if, giver if you'd like to do that. Uh, we are a nonprofit. And so be sure to check out StanFirmMinistries.com. You can go to StanFirmMinistries.com slash give or see the give tab and uh, do that. Also, we have a YouTube channel. But if you're there, you know that, right? But you can help us tremendously by subscribing to our YouTube channel or if you're on Facebook, liking our Facebook page. And please share, help us spread the word and help others stand firm. We also have an initiative called Stand Firm Kids, StanFirmKids.com. As we're trying to work and help uh, parents and churches build a faith that lasts within their kids and also help them navigate such a time as this. And we also want to give you a free resource for hanging in there and being a part of this. Uh, you can go to our previous, when you are here message, uh, StanFirmMinistry.com, you are here message and receive our guide to the prophets for free. And, uh, Again, we just want to thank you for tuning in and being a part of Stand Firm. Please help us by subscribing, liking our page, and we would always love the chance to, to be there in, in person. And so if you've got an event or if you're uh, in your church or just a local Bible study, community group, whatever it is, we'd love the chance to share this message and encourage and help believers navigate such a time as this.